Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. I have a couple announcements for you guys. We have an awesome couple coming and speaking at The Collective on July 29th and the 30th. That will also be our last in-person message. So for the month of August, we will not have any in-person services, but we'll continue to upload all of our house church services every Sunday. Today we are going to continue on with Josh's five-fold leadership training series. And before we do that, I'd just like to pray for everyone. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you that we have leaders that are equipping us and teaching us more about how you have called us to be, Lord. We love you so much, Lord, and I just ask that you bless this time together, you bless everyone's week, and that you open our hearts to receive this message today. In your name, amen. Jesus, be exalted, Lord. We're being thrown on our praise, Jesus. Lord, we worship you. We worship you, Jesus. Fill us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill this place, Lord, with your presence. We invite you, Lord. We need you.
when you fill the room You're here and I know you are moving And I'm here and I know you will fill me Lord, fill us with your joy, Jesus Jesus, fill us with your joy, Lord Your joy is our strength Lord, we worship you, we praise you right now Lord, you're the only one that salvation comes from beyond your reach. Lord, we praise you. We love you, Jesus. Have your way, Lord. Have your way, Jesus. Have your way, Jesus. Lord, we need you. We need you. We love you. that up to him right now. Lord, we need you. Lord, we need you. Come, Lord. Lord we need you. We love you. <laughs> You're so good. Love you. Jesus. How's it going, everyone? Welcome to lesson two of the fivefold training ministry. I want to thank you for joining the collective as we tackle this this training that was originally designed for our house church leaders. And we're here in lesson two. If you haven't seen lesson one, go back. It kind of sets the framework of uh, where we're headed. So in lesson two, this is where we talk about our calling, our roles and responsibilities. And there are many different five-fold assessment tests you can take online that just start to to break ground on identifying your personal gifts. So that's something we had our house church leaders do, but it's just a start. It's not the end-all, be-all of uh, defining what your your calling is. Um, and as a disclaimer, some of these surveys, and even as we walk through through our lives, um, we can sometimes get off, off going down a path that we didn't really, really know where we were headed. And so maybe you said, oh, I'm definitely a pastor. I'm going down that road. And then someone may speak into your life and say, hey, I really see you as an evangelist. That's okay, right? Because as we mature, we are growing into these gifts. So if you've taken one of these tests and it says you're a pastor and you're like, there's no way I could be a pastor, don't worry about it, right? Because we're just maturing in the things of Christ. And Many times people will come alongside you, trusted people that see something, see a spark in you that you don't see in yourself. So I would ask that if that does happen, just continue to pray into it, pray into God's uh, word and what he's speaking. And God is always faithful. He is always touching us in ways that sometimes we didn't anticipate. And, and it takes us sometimes into a new direction. So I just encourage you to pour into that. Um, and as we discuss these roles and responsibilities, there's two dichotomies that I want you to be aware of. First of all, we may have a gift and not realize that we have an assignment of that office. So, so many of us have walked our adult lives and we, we have no clue that we have a gift. And that's bad. But knowing you have a gift and not knowing you have an assignment, that's equally as bad. Because we know we're saying we're equipped and yet we're not using ourselves to fulfill a mission that God has specifically given us. Additionally, some of us may want, maybe actually seeking and desire a gift very strongly, um, but we haven't invested anything into developing those gifts. So we need to make sure those are set appropriately. We're, we need to start with humility and develop those gifts, and it's the Holy Spirit that's going to that's gonna help bring fruit from that, from that development. So um, just, just a couple guidelines there. So first of all, where... Where does the fivefold fit into God's plan and God's giftings? Okay, because sometimes it's hard if we look at 1 Corinthians and we're looking at spiritual gifts. So, where does that fit within this context of the fivefold? So, I want to run through that for about five minutes and, and just get an understanding of, of how God has equipped us appropriately for the fivefold to build up the church. So, first of all, understand that God loves us. That's critical. And He's offering gifts to us. He wants us to be with him eternally, and he wants us as a church to be united, okay? So those, 
just the groundwork. God loves us. He wants for us two things, salvation and unity. He wants to be with us forever, and he wants us to be as a church together in a healthy way. Okay, so we have to have that understanding. If either of those two perspectives are, are perverted or lost in any way, the fivefold is dysfunctional. Because if we can't have unity, it doesn't work. And if we don't know our true identity in Christ, that he loves us, that he's a loving father and wants to be with us forever, our whole goal is turned upside down. So we have to have that foundation. Secondly, if God wants salvation and unity for us, how do we build this unity? Well, we have to be walking in his will. Unity as a church requires that we are all moving forward in the will of Christ. And, and so many of us ponder, like, God, what is your will for my life? Who am I going to marry? What job it, should I work at? What car should I drive? Where should I live? Do I move across state? And those questions are good questions, and, and they're important to God, but that has nothing to do with God's will. See, the Bible makes it very clear what God's will is. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, for this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. That's the will of God. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, it doesn't matter where we work, who we marry, what car we drive, as long as we're moving forward with these priorities, then the world is God's playground and we're still within the will of God. First Thessalonians chapter 4, First Thessalonians chapter 5, Micah 6, 8. Look these things up. They all talk about the will of God. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? That's a question we should all be asking. What does the Lord require of us? Micah 6, 8, to do justice to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. You see, God's not telling us to send our kids to this school or that school to pick this wife or that husband. He's telling us to seek after him, to do, live righteously. And as we move forward in that, he will, bring, he will heap on the blessings on top of that. And so this is how we walk in unity as a church, is us all moving forward in God's will. Okay, so first of all, salvation and unity. How do we move forward in unity? We have to be in the will of God. So the Bible gives us, lays out the will of God, but some of those are pretty tall orders, right? So how do we function correctly in the will of God? How do we live this out on a daily basis where we're always walking humbly, where we're always seeking after what, what is true and right and healthy for us? Well, God has given us one thing to help us do that. We call that community. We call that his church as we come alongside of each other and iron sharpens iron and we hold each other accountable. And that's uncomfortable for many of us. Many of us have spent our entire lives, in fact, withdrawing and isolating ourselves. And that right there is the tool of the enemy. Isolation absolutely keeps us in an unhealthy state. It keeps us with our faults. It keeps us in a in a, our comfort zone. And we know that we only grow during times of discomfort. Romans 5 says, rejoice in your sufferings. Why on earth would we rejoice in our sufferings? Because it builds perseverance and character. And it's only when we mature in our character that we have hope. And so if we've spent our whole lives isolating and drawing back, we've been fooled by the devil and we're not participating in community, in God's community. And this is an organization that he started and he wants to complete. And so God's role for the church, we see it in chapter four of Ephesians. It says one, and we reviewed this in lesson one. The role for the church is to equip the saints. The role for the church is building up the body of Christ. It's this community. It's this breaking of bread together that they talk about in Acts chapter six. Excuse me, Acts chapter two. It's spreading the truth to the lost. It's growing in personal maturity. And it's keeping this unity where the Holy Spirit puts this bond of peace. That the New Testament talks about this bond of peace that the Holy Spirit puts over his people as we're maturing and working together. And so that's the role of the church. So if the role of the church 
is to help grow us and mature us, that's how we fulfill the will of God. And so you see this cascade effect again towards the positive. God loves us. He wants unity and salvation. How do we get unity? We have to follow his will. How do we follow his will? We participate, grow, and mature within the body of Christ. So how do we build the church? This is where the fivefold comes in. We build the church through the apostolic, through the prophetic, through the evangelical, through the pastoral, and through teaching. This is how we build the church. So how do we fulfill the fivefold? This is where 1 Corinthians chapter 12 comes in. God has given each of us spiritual gifts, and there's a long list of them. Knowledge, wisdom, purity, faith, healing, miracles, discernment of spirits. There's a whole list of spiritual gifts that God gives to us uniquely so that we can fulfill the fivefold. You see, every pastor that God is calling is going to look different. They're going to use their own unique gifts to carry out that pastoral role. Every apostle, every prophet that God is calling, and you can see it throughout the Bible, Peter and Paul were at odds with each other in many cases, and yet they were both called apostles. They had different gifts, and yet the same calling. And that's true for you and me as well in the church. You may be a teacher, but you're going to use different gifts than I may use to fulfill that calling. And so we have to be diving into our own spiritual gifts and God says he, he showers us with spiritual gifts just by believing in him. They're all accessible to us, but they have to be, de- be developed. They have to be disciplined in order to be effective. And so these spiritual gifts that God gives us start pouring back into the fivefold ministry. And so it's important that we understand that flow. And in chapter, excuse me, in lesson four, we'll talk about flowing into the role of the fivefold a little bit more, but we have to have this understanding and kind of back up and say, well, what's the big plan? Salvation and unity. Okay, how do we do that? We're in the will of God. How do we follow that out on a daily basis? We're walking together and building each other up in the church. Well, how do we build the church? We use the fivefold. How do we do that? Spiritual gifts. Does that make sense as we bring it all together? And that's, this, is, this whole thing is the discipleship process, right? We can't just plop someone off at church and expect them to be an effective tool for Christ. We have to grow this. We have to build this. Okay, so now that we've gone through that plan, where, we, where the fivefold sits within context of God's overall salvation plan, I want to talk specifically about the five different offices of the fivefold. Now, some of the terminology and vocabulary that we are accustomed to using in church, some of us have already detached and disassoci- disassociated from. And so when someone says, wow, you're a prophet, for some of us that has connotations that we're like, wait a minute, is that even biblical? I thought the prophets had very specific requirements in the Old Testament. How are you calling me a prophet now? And so some of us are going to have our guards up and that's healthy. That's absolutely healthy. But I don't want the vocabulary to turn us away from what God is calling. So, uh, Take this journey with me, first of all. So the first one we're going to talk about is the apostolic ministry. Apostolos, that means that you're a delegate or you're an ambassador or a commissioner for Christ. And so in terms of that definition, is it possible that God is calling some of us to be an ambassador for Christ? Yes, absolutely. You and I are all called to be ambassadors for Christ, but he's gifted some of us in that way. And the apostle, which we put into this governing category, this is someone who can lay a foundation. This is someone who can see um, a biblical or heavenly structure and overlay it onto our human systems. Um, This is someone who sends out. This is someone who builds. And all these characteristics I'm talking about this, has, this is absolutely relevant for us today. This is not something that God left in the Old Testament 2,000 years ago. All of these character traits are still active for us today and still so needed if the church is going to come to its full maturity. So the ability to build, to send out, to establish, these are the character traits of an apostle, this governing capability. 1 Corinthians 
chapter 3, verse 10, talks about this master builder concept where we're able to take what God has in mind and start putting it into action here on earth. And so when we look at this apostolic ministry, the first apostle, who was that? Well, Jesus was absolutely the first apostle. He is the master builder. He's the one that came down and laid down the framework for the church. After that, we had the original 12 apostles that Jesus called. And it took them three years or more to really start fulfilling their calling. And so for each of us, let that be a lesson to us that we don't just hop into this and automatically know what to do. Jesus was walking alongside these men for over three years. And even then, they stumbled occasionally. So we have Jesus as the original apostle. We have the original 12 apostles who were called after that. And they had a a calling that was focused on the church. They They had a life that was worthy of carrying authority. And you will see that in the apostolic ministry today. A true apostle will have a life, every nook and cranny of their house, every text message, underneath their sock drawer, wherever you expose in their life, there's no cockroaches hiding there. These are people that are absolutely are worthy of carrying authority. You may have that authority called out in your own life and you may have some cleaning up to do and that's true for all of us. We have to be a people that is worthy of carrying authority if we're gonna carry out God's, God's mission. And so those are just some high level overview descriptions of what the apostolic ministry might look like. Remember, it's this governing ministry. Secondly is the prophetic. Prophetic is um, the guiding ministry, okay? First, we have the governing ministry. The prophetic is the guiding ministry. This is a person who is able to call out the invisible into the invisible. This is a person who's able to see through a myriad of tools, and this is not a, a prophetic teaching so to speak, because there's a lot that goes into that. We have dreams, we have active visions, we have the audible word of God, we have the written word of God. There's a lot of ways that prophets can take what God is saying and speak it out into the church. The most basic one is just the the gift of encouragement. You know, when you're able to, to walk up into someone's life and just give them an ounce of truth that encourages them, that is the prophetic ministry in a very active way because we know that God thinks these things of them. You are loved. You are cherished. You are a princess of our Christ. If we can say those things, that is the prophetic mission being carried out because you're speaking truth from the word of God into someone's life. You're calling out what was invisible to them into the visible realm. And that is a very basic example of the prophetic ministry. This guiding ministry is both forthtelling and foretelling. All right, so this idea that we're taking God's word and we're explaining it to people, but we're also telling what God wants to do in your life in the future. This is absolutely something that was done in the Bible, and God is speaking to us occasionally in this way, even for today. You can see the guiding prophetic ministry in times of both encouragement, which I talked about, but also in times of warning, right? As parents, we have a prophetic role with our kids saying, hey, if you go down this role, if you go down this path, as my child, you're gonna end up at a destination that you don't wanna be. And some of us might call that common sense, but the reality is that's biblical truth that is being foretold into the future. And again, at a very basic level, that is the prophetic ministry at work. There are some key differences between the prophetic of the Old Testament and of the New Testament. The biggest one is Jesus himself. Um, He was our atonement for sin an atonement that the Old Testament prophets didn't have accessible to them, nor did they have the Holy Spirit. So that's a huge, huge difference. This Holy Spirit anointing, this gifting of the prophetic, which we see initially at Pentecost, was totally different than the anointing that the Old Testament prophets had. So there are some distinctions, and that's that's something worth diving into. But we know from Ephesians chapter 4 that the prophetic ministry is available and active to us. God is calling us to use the prophetic ministry in all of its various facets to build up the church. And so this is really exciting as we talk talk about this. So um, the apostolic, again, was the governing. The prophetic was the guiding. Let's get into the uh, evangelical. This comes from a word called eugalistes, and I'm probably pronouncing that 
incorrectly, but it means bringer of good news. So this, these are people who are able to communicate God's love without compromising the truth. And that's, that is a huge responsibility. It's so easy to, to dangle a sweet carrot in front of someone without telling them the truth. And so a true evangelist will always communicate love, but never withhold the truth. And so the evangelical ministry is a gathering ministry. It's a, it's a ministry of bringing people in and pre- bringing people together. This is a ministry where we're casting the net of Christ's love, love for every individual, and we're communicating that love and truth. We're creating space for new believers, and we're communicating that there is a role in a, in a personal Savior for everyone. Um, the ev- evangelical is able to see people as Christ see them, which I, that is really hard for me. And that's something, an area of growth for me. And I know I'm not an evangelist, but good evangelists, they see people like Christ see them. They see them as loved and wanted and desired to be a part of God's body. And, and that is a gifting of, of the evangelist. Um, the office of the ev- evangelical will be marked by the heart of a father for his people, by going out into the world, by working closely with the apostolic for establishing new churches. And the Bible says often signs and wonders will accompany the evangelical as God displays his power for the redirecting of the lost. So that's exciting as well. So that's the evangelical of the gathering. Two more, the pastoral. This is the guarding, okay? So we have the governing, the guiding. The evangelical was the gathering, and the pastoral is the guarding. These are people that want to protect God's sheep. These are people that have a mind to keep people from isolation, keep people from slipping away, and to call out wolves in the sheep's pen. Um, The office of the pastoral would be marked by a few specific things. One, protecting the flock. This is someone who's reaching out to people and say, hey, where have you been? Hey, don't go there. This is not healthy for you. It's also in a healthy way, in a respectful way, This is someone who's looking up to church leadership and saying, is God really saying that? And protecting the flock from the pastors. Um, This is someone who has a heart for lost sheep. This is someone on watch for wolves, whether that's in the church or outside of the church. And this is someone who is typically focused on the local church. um, And they're guarding the local church. The last one is the teacher. This is the grounding. This comes from a Greek word called didaskalos, which means to instruct or to doctor, which is a really interesting take on this teacher role of using truth to heal people. Uh, The grounding teacher builds on a foundation of truth in love. So they're juxtaposed to the evangelist, where the evangelist communicates love with truth. The teacher communicates truth with love. And that's an important distinction because you can have teachers who are absolutely bringing truth, but they detach and dissociate from love. And that message is compromised when we uh, remove the love from it. Um, teachers illuminate God's truth and they sear God's word into the hearts of people. Um, the office of the teacher will be marked by a hunger for the truth, getting into scripture and dissecting it, pulling it apart and making sure it lines up with what God's doing. The office of the teacher um, is, is noticed by personal revelations about what God is saying. It's leading others back to the cross through illumination of God's word, and it's receiving direction and coherence from the apostolic and prophetic missions. So within the church, if you have teachers who are going a different direction than what the apostolic is doing, that is an unhealthy balance. So that teacher needs to be tapped into the apostolic mission so that there's coherence. And it's so critical for us to have unity within the church when the entire fivefold is working together in the same direction. So I know that was a lot, but we have to understand, one, what the different roles are. And I hope as we start dissecting the different roles that some of these are connecting with you in your spirit, that you're saying, yes, that's me. I have a heart for the lost sheep. Or yeah, that's me. I see things in colors and numbers and visions and dreams. So I hope as we go through this, uh, some of those are connecting with you. But just as importantly, we have to know where the fivefold fits in with the rest of our giftings and with God's salvation plan. 
So thank you for coming on this journey with us. Uh, I pray that you digest this over the next couple weeks or the next week. And let me close this out with a prayer. Lord, we just thank you for the fivefold ministry. We thank you for this beautiful picture where everyone is coming together and creating a mature, healthy body that is equipped to save the lost, that is equipped for unity. Lord, I pray that you give us strength and courage to step out into some of these roles. Give us the wisdom as we hone our gifts, as we refine our skills in these areas. In Jesus' name, amen.